my name is Eric Brown. I am the director of the Alice Project at Carnegie Mellon University. This is the start of us trying to host some weekly workshops on Alice, followed by some questions and answers, so that if anybody wants to start using Alice in the classroom, um, or our parents at home trying to entertain kids and give them something both creative um, and educational, that Alice can be there. Um, the very first thing I wanted to open up with in case people are watching this and trying to figure out if they can use Alice is that Alice will not work on a Chromebook without some fairly intensive switching of a Chromebook into a Linux computer. Um, we do have information for that if you wanted to do that. Uh, we are a downloaded application. It's built on Java, so you will need a desktop computer that will not run on mobile, um, an iPad, uh, or a Chromebook. Um, you do not need internet once you download and install the application. For a lot of our users around the world, this has been a benefit over the years in terms of the ability for Alice to, to work in places where internet connectivity isn't ubiquitous. Um, what was a benefit for us um, in this current time has become a little bit of a challenge just in terms of students having um, more mobile devices and intentional for um, web-based applications. In the future, we do hope to support that with Alice. It is in our technical development pipeline. It is just not something that we are prepared to support now. So I hope that you find ways to distribute the Alice application um, and that the benefit of it not being online might be helpful for some and that you find ways around that and we will do what we can to support you. So I wanted to get that question out of the way. We've been getting a lot of outreach from schools, especially one-to-one -one Chromebook schools that now don't have access to a computer lab for Alice of what we can do there. Again, reach out to our contact if you want to discuss the possibility of turning Chromebooks into sort of Linux machines. Again, it's not something that we highly recommend, but it is possible. That being said, I'm gonna jump into a little bit about Alice. If you're just coming to us and don't know anything about Alice or um, a very high level of Alice, I'm going to do a presentation. This is one that we usually open up our workshops with. So away we go. Alice is a platform for learning basic coding while creating animations and games. This is an animation that was done by one of our artists. We love to show it just because it's um, very intensive. This is a spooky Alice. So like I said, that one was a pretty in-depth animation, but it shows that Alice really at its base was created as a tool to 
enable storytelling and making games and things like that. Even that animation uses a bunch of programming for things like the spinning books. Alice can be used for very simple animations, very long animations. Um, and we'll talk a lot about the tie-ins for design thinking um, around using storyboarding and scripts and things like that as a, as a means to um, enable student creativity and then motivation um, or just as Alice as a platform for creating 3D animations. All of the, the models you saw there in our gallery built in, they're all available for um, kids, students, anyone to use to create animated stories. I'm gonna show another example of an Alice creation. This is actually using our new Alice player, which I'll share a little bit more about later. Um, this was created by a middle school student. She did amazing work. This is part of our Alice challenge and created a very rich um, adventure game. Um, she actually pushed Alice in ways that we didn't know and we've used it sort of as a benchmark for performance. So this player is a way that we're uh, enabling kids to share or creators of Alice to share their worlds without the whole Alice authoring environment. Uh, we are gonna put out some how to's of how people can actually take their Alice worlds and wrap them in this player and rename it and distribute them as um, Unity applications. A lot of people will use billboard images and things like that for title screens and things like that. She elected to use 3D text, um, programmed mouse clicks on the boxes, so directions, click box to continue, click on animals to interact with them, um, use arrow keys to move, and then of course have fun. That is the world that she built in Alice using all of our 3D models. Um, the basic story of the game is that you're this baby bear and your sister is missing. Um, what I don't think you can hear through Zoom is that she actually used all of her family members as voiceover actors. So while there is speech bubbles, there is also audio for that. Um, you go out into the world, there's lots of animals to interact with. So using arrow keys to walk around, um, speaking to other animals, they give you clues as things to do. Um, I'll let this one play because it's just cute and funny. One of the mechanics she built in was that one of the other animals asked you to go forage mushrooms. So you walk through them and collect them, keeps track of how many. Um, I'll let people explore this one. This is actually shared as a feature project on our website. Um, but you can see sort of the rich world that she's created and the ability to move around and sort of some game mechanics and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities both through animations or open worlds and interactive games to do really impressive things. I'm gonna now show what Alice actually looks like as a programming platform. Well, testing Alice constantly. So this is actually our newest beta. But when you first come into Alice, you choose sort of the where you want your story or game to take place. So that's sort of the grounds and things like that. So Wonderland, Seafloor, we do have some starter worlds that help uh, people using Alice jump in with some richer environments. Um, we'll go ahead and put it on the sea floor. If any of you are familiar with things like Scratch or Blockly or other block-based coding environments, which really just means that you don't type text, um, some of this will look familiar. Um, the main difference being is that here is our scene building. And so, like I said, we have a whole gallery of resources that you can drag into the environment, um, lots of different ways to manipulate it. So there's a clownfish reminiscent of a Disney character that you can build scenes with. Then when you go over to the code editor side of things, you'll see that any of the objects that you add show up here. And essentially you drag and drop statements into the program that allows us to sort of help you not build broken code. Um, a lot of our sort of directions are based on animation and storytelling and things like that. The goal of the workshop as we progress week through week is gonna to be to really guide you through each of the different components, how to build a scene, how to use the programmer or the programming side of things, 
all the way up into creating those interactive elements that you saw in the BearQuest world. Um, you run the world. This is sort of our insert side Alice ability to just build and test and build and test. And so iterative design process, which we think is really important for um, learning in Alice because you get visual feedback on what you're doing. Um, you saw the other player that I was showing you that then runs it um, in a full screen sort of Unity environment. That being said, now you've seen Alice and some of the Alice creations. I am going to jump into my presentation again. So show you the examples. Uh, a brief history of Alice um, is very important to us to point out our legacy and that if any of you have ever heard of Randy Pausch, the founder of Alice, um, he was a professor at CMU who was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Um, there is a lecture series at CMU for re retiring and departing professors called The Last Lecture, where you impart your um, parting wisdom um, on the community at large. Obviously, that took a very different connotation given Randy's situation. Um, Randy was one of my professors. Um, I miss him, obviously. Um, so that last lecture went viral on YouTube. It was one of the sort of first viral YouTube videos. And it was very powerful for just his um, explanation of his journey through life. A lot of things that he touched on were his uh, engagement in both the analytical computer science world, the art world, achieving his life goals. It is very inspirational. It was then published into a book called The Last Lecture. A lot of teachers, and students come to us from that having been inspired by Randy's words. Um, we highly recommend people take a look at it, um, can obviously use it as a tie-in for Alice or just parts of it in general for people in this space and the right brain and left brain and um, those types of things. Mm -hmm. This cartoon right here is depicting that, you know, at the end, um, he was espousing the doing things. So be a tigger and embrace life as opposed to um running from it um fairly apropos in our current situation um but so he started the alice project he started the alice project actually all the way back at the university of virginia when he started his first vr research lab um he had started that vr research lab um and done sort of a paper called vr on five dollars a day where he sort of pioneered that at the time, VR hardware was very expensive, and so how could you get a lab up and running um, in an economical way for people to start exploring virtual reality? Uh, when he went out and started looking at the sort of premier VR research labs, he saw that another challenge of VR was that most of the world's being created, and you can see sort of the graphical quality of the time that a lot of this was going on. The time for program to program and then to iterate and republish was a challenge in just sort of exploring the what is cool in VR and what is possible. Alice was born as a prototyping tool for that lab to allow them to rapidly compile and test things and iterate and bring designers into the fold of being able to create content as well so it wasn't sort of gated by programmer challenges. Um, Around the 2000s, uh, Wanda Dan and Steve Cooper, um, Randy was also doing things with trying to teach his kids using Alice. Uh, this was sort of the time of eToys. Randy did a sabbatical, Alan Keyes, things like that. So it was sort of a culmination of a lot of things in early computer science education. Wanda Dan and Steve Cooper ran a summer sort of trial of using Alice as a basic programming tool, met Randy. Um, he loved what they were doing. It, fell in with a lot of things. And that was when Alice really became an intentional tool for teaching early computer science. This is the book that came from that work. It is still a great book. So that gets into learning with Alice. Why is Alice great as a teaching tool? So we talk about that creating scenes with 3D objects in a vir virtual world has sort of a very different motivational capacity. So there are lots of great tools and we love them all. For 2D sprite-based animation or puzzle-based learning, Alice really gets into that part that says uh, action figures as kids. Um, you set up a scene or you create a Lego world and you wanna bring it to life. So the motivation to build those worlds is there and just our love of creation. And then of course, we wanna tell stories using those and that's where we sort of 
motivate people to use their creativity and then that motivates them to learn how to do things in Alice. We do love puzzle-based learning, but this sort of creative open-ended where I get to tell my stories and I'm enabled to do my own things um, affects different learners and different motivations for learning. So that's a little bit of things that we love about Alice and we've heard that people love about Alice. It, the process of learning using Alice is a blend of sort of the creativity. You saw the things that have been created using Alice. To be able to make those, you have to learn skills in Alice. And to learn skills in Alice, you have to, whether you know it or not, learn concepts around programming um, and logic. So using the traditional problem solving techniques, a lot of our lessons and a lot of the work that's been done creating lessons around Alice goes into sort of computational thinking and just general problem solving. Um, ours and Randy's book, going back to the beginning, integrating storyboarding and algorithm design sort of fuses a bunch of the things from early computer science and best practices with things taken from the animation and film industry in terms of pre-production, thinking about story and narrative and those types of things. Um, and then onto the games industry when we talk about games documents, game design documents. Um, it does making, make developing accessible using a visual programming language. This is one of the benefits that has been found for a lot of the so robotics and black-based coding environments and things like that. Anything where there is a tangible outcome so that when they do something, they can see the outcome right away as opposed to complex programming that might do something like build a calculator where there's not a lot of ways to get um, direct feedback along the way and incremental uh, steps. And then a lot of project-based learning opportunities. So learning those applications, there can be sort of tutorials, exercises, things like that, um, but obviously lends itself well to letting them go off and do their own project and building the curriculum around that. What does Alice teach? We talk, talk a lot about logical thinking, computational thinking, Obviously, it comes from teaching computer science, so we have a lot of things built into our lessons around fundamental computer science concepts. Um, later on in the workshops, we can get into how what they've learned can be migrated directly into introductory Java. That's where Alice has a long history and sort of intro Java courses as a way to teach basic concepts of object-oriented programming. We do have some advanced tools that show you Java on the side, allow you to bring it into NetBeams and things like that. But we also see a broad subject matter integration. It doesn't have to just be a tool for computer science. It can be a tool for integrated technology into classes like language arts in our storyboarding and things like that. If you're writing a script, if you're breaking down sort of nouns and verbs, if you're creating storyboards, there's lots of opportunities for fractional math and creating other things. And then it can also just be a great tool as a fine art tool. Ignoring that you are actually going to be teaching them other things along the way, it is an accessible tool for creating these animations and games um, that I would put up there with a lot of the other sort of game makers and, and animation studio tools and things like that as an entry level tool. We see it in a lot of technology courses, obviously, introductions to technology, fundamentals of programming, introduction to programming. Um, we have seen adoption at computer science principles. We might have some teachers come in as part of this workshop segue to give a very specific one on how they've been successful in using it for the create task of introduction AP computer science A, it is obviously or computer science principles. They've just seen it do well there and so would love to have them share their feedback on that. Like I was saying that we will get into later ones where the block to text transition is somewhere where there's a lot of research being done now. How do we get the kids who have played with all of these block-based coding environments understand how that knowledge translates when they actually get into real programming. Um, so we have created some things. There is another textbook out that sort of builds on some research the team did on hugging of doing something in Alice, something in Java, something in Alice, something in Java. So sort of scaffolding that transition, incremental touch points and those types of things. So Alice can be a good tool for that. I think this goes for a lot of the CS tools that are out there these days, but there was some research done on Alice that showed that if you were taking a CS1 Java course and you had no touch points with Alice um, or no prior engagement with Alice, that we actually saw huge jumps in terms of both the performance of students if they used Alice and then big jumps in terms of the motivation then for students to continue on into computer science to another course. Support for teachers. Well, here's one support. We normally hold a week-long summer workshop um, we may do that online this summer 
Oracle Academy has a bunch of online workshops for Alice. Um, Susan Rogers at Duke has a Coursera course and hosts workshops on Alice. There's a lot of resources out there. I'll show the website after I get through this to show you where to find things. We hope that our community shares back opportunities. Um, we do have a teacher listserv that is very active. And even though we hope to help as many people as we can out there, we have Don Slater who's been our teacher support person and a member of the team for a long time and teaches with Alice and has taught with Alice. who will answer questions very rapidly there. Um, other teachers are another great resource. So we, anybody interested in Alice, we suggest they sign up for that list serve as a great um, resource. Uh, curricular materials, we have multiple available textbooks that our team has authored. There's lots of textbooks out there that others have authored that we think are great. The online course materials, I talked about Coursera. Art Lopez has done a lot of things with CF, CS principles, with Beth Simon's work. Um, so I will show you where to find a bunch of those things. Lots of teachers have created how-to content. We are trying our best to sort of migrate those, to share them out as best we can. So look for more and more of that as we go. This is the second textbook that was talking about, the creative programming through storytelling and gaming that the team recently put out that does that hugging of Alice and Java as an optional track that you don't necessarily have to. When we go and I show you the website, really the things that we've tried to do with our materials was create ways for you to build the curriculum that fits your time frame. So, or if you are a self learner or a parent, that you know there are things around scene building and coding in Alice that everybody needs to learn just to be able to use Alice. You can sort of use those as teaching opportunities for things like what is a virtual environment. If you're doing programming, it can be class and objects. These are the orange ones. Um, if you're trying to integrate some math teaching, we've seen lots of things like Alice in the Middle East has some challenges where they set up a big grid board and then ask the students to build that scene using XYZ coordinates. So it can be a good way to teach 3D and coordinates. Fractional math, most of our turns and things like that are, you know, fractional 0 0.1, 0 0.5, one is a full rotation. So there's ways that you can lean into some of that. Um, and then the purple ones are just the things that you have to know in Alice. So if you're just using those to create things, we will teach you how to add objects and orient objects and things like that. It continues through. We have event programming, conditional programming. Those are the things that you'll need to learn to be able to create those interactive worlds and games. Again, sort of the core of Alice is just learning how to set up a scene and doing the basic coding. You can then teach a lesson on animation and animation design. So we'll see a little bit more about that. The Alice player is that Unity player that I showed you. We're pretty excited about that as a way for people creating things in Alice to share them out themselves. We're working on the WebGL hookins so that they can share their animations and games on websites, distribute the games themselves. I'll circle back on that one. That same player, if you have access to VR hardware, will now actually bring Alice full circle back to where students can author content for VR. We're really excited about that because VR is something that we've engaged for a long time. Alice has a long history. It was used in building virtual worlds course, which led to the Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon University. So as a tool for just exploring VR, learning to create content for VR, which really just enables some amazing things and gets people excited. Um, there's a lot of great content being created for VR. Uh, there's tools to create your own VR content, but we think Alice is a great fit for early accessible content creation, whereas using some of the industry tools like Unity might be a little bit advanced, but we can actually get people creating VR worlds in, in a very short matter of time. We have some other tools at the Entertainment Technology Center where the Alice team has supported research and student projects. Um, we have some great ones. I want to show you an example of uh, another Ad Alice adventure for Teachers out there just want to teach game design or kids that want to create game design, getting to that Bear Quest game takes a pretty in-depth amount of Alice knowledge. We hope that you will get there, but if you wanted to start creating adventure games, which are a really great way to learn if else conditionals, there's great ways to do that in Alice. I guess one last one, special thanks to all of our funders that make Alice possible and make it free to all of you and all of our resources. So we wanted to make sure to call them out in the process. I do have one question. Since sure. um, pause, Jim Davis uh, sold everything except the um, uh, the comic strip to Viacom. You still have access to the characters, don't you? 
Ooh, senior and lawyers too. probably don't want me to answer that. I am going to push ahead and say that our rights to use it in Alice too, since it predates that, would continue on. I would um, think so because uh, I did all of the puzzle material for the website, and uh, I retained. Jim gave me the right to continue to use the intellectual material that I created. Very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would also hope that, you know, the nature of what we're doing, it would have to take somebody very heartless to come along and uh, tell us to stop doing what we're doing or pull content out. So, yeah. I saw yeah, it I on, the, uh, on the credit in screen. In case I keep some of this stuff going. Um, one of the other things that's very exciting about Alice is Alice too has Garfield content in there. I was a huge Garfield fan when I was a kid. Um, so there are those resources in Alice too and Alice three, um, Brandy did an amazing deal with electronic arts. Mm -hmm. And so we have a bunch of the Sims resources in Alice three, which is super exciting just because lots of kids play with the Sims. I actually worked on the Sims. Um, one of the frustrations can be is that the Sims wander off and do whatever you want as part of the fun of the game. But in Alice, you can program them to do exactly what you want for once as opposed to wander off and do whatever they like. So I'm just gonna walk through where to find some things on alice.org and a little bit about these things. So alice.org, this is where we land. So there's you know, some interesting things here. One section of the home page that I would like to point out is we have this featured projects. There's a bunch of examples from the community, some things created by the Alice team. We are always open to you sharing your work with us. Um, we love it if you share both the file, a video capture, and as we get to the Unity things, even a published game version or animated film version, um, and we will share it up. A little bit of backstory is always great. So like. Um, what is the story, what motivated you, those types of things, so that we can share those out. So an example of a featured world here is Peacock Romance. Um, you'll see there's the video file, the project file. This was a project received from a student at a school in Illinois. Um, so you can peruse those. That's where that Halloween world that I showed earlier in the, in the, work, in the webcast workshop um, came from. It is also hosted up there. We will try to put more things as well. The brief history of Alice can be found under our About Alice section. So I touched on a couple of these points, but here's the Born as a Vote prototyping tool. This was the first moment that it came out really just for 3D on computers. So in the early days, it actually was used um, just as a 3D graphics tool in a lot of classrooms. You can read some of the things I spoke about there. The birth of the first book, so that was a huge moment in ours. Um, Caitlin Kelleher over at Washington University in St. Louis, another one of my, I am on the waters, um, has continued to do a lot of work around storytelling in Alice. That was, um, she was part of Randy's early team. You can go look at Looking Glass there. Uh, there was the research done on how to better improve block to text. And that has led a lot to the creation that you see of the Alice 3 version that I'm going to show more of. Alice 2 is still available. Um, there are great parts of that as well. Um, we are trying to support both. We're a small team. So we have focused a lot of our efforts on Alice 3 and listening to Alice 2 teachers or people that like Alice 2 to integrate the features they love about Alice 2 into Alice 3 as much as we can. Um, we did move from the human computer interaction uh, department of the School of Computer Science, um, where Randy's lab was, down to the Entertainment Technology Center, a graduate program that Randy founded, um, also at Tony Mellon University. And we continue to do great things and try to. You'll see the team, thanks to our donors, um, lots of other things. Get Alice is where you can get versions of the software and get started. So here you will see a couple links. So you can see Alice 3, you can see the NetBeans plugin for Alice 3, which allows you to modify the Java code yourself. You'll see Alice 2. Uh, if you look at the sidebar, you'll see that there's a Unity plus VR beta. So this is the one that is that Unity player. If you want to use our latest and greatest, um, go there. 
encapsulated in there is actually the ability to import your own models into Alice. So we've been working with uh, artists to try to open up in Alice 3 the ability to bring in models, which is something that people did a lot of in Alice 2. We just wanted to make it in a way that it would form to some of the inheritance and shared qualities that I'll talk about in later version, later discussions of Alice. Um, so definitely come and check out these. If you click on any of them, you will then see the download versions that you should need, some installation instructions. Um, I will say that we are working with CMU. Our downloads are not signed as of now, so um, admin privileges are sort of needed to download or you'll have to bypass some warnings. Um, again, check on that installing Alice 3 if you have any challenges. It really requires just sort of right clicking or selecting open anyway or some other things and then opening it the first time as admin for installation. Again, you can reach out to our contact form if you have any issues with that. Um, many of the newer Mac and PC OSs have implemented even stronger security features, so it needs a little bit of workaround. We are working with CMU to get them as signed Mac and PC apps so that hopefully it would alleviate some of that. Um, you may still run into some of those issues, both with Alice 3 and Alice 2. Again, reach out to us. The resources section, uh, we have resources for Alice 3 and Alice 2. Alice 2 has a built-in tutorial, so there's a little bit less, and there was just so many textbooks done that um, there's lots of materials out there for Alice 2 and not as many for Alice 3, so we focus a lot of our efforts on creating things for Alice 3, but there are things in the Alice 3 section. We have these sections over here, how-tos, lessons, exercises, and projects, an audio library, curriculums, and textbooks. I spoke a lot about sort of the textbooks that were out there. Um, again, there's a page like this for both Alice 2 and Alice 3. You'll see a bunch written by us, written by others, um, links to other resources that are just digital ebooks and things like that. Um, it seems that I am missing some things on here that I will circle back on. Um, the curriculum section of Alice 3, this is sort of the work in progress for if you look at the Building and Alice curriculum, I spoke a little bit about this in the introduction of just how we thought about our lessons as modules and how you can create one for them, from them. You can see here, this is, somebody had brought up Susan Rogers' work. Um, she has done amazing things. This will link you over to her website where there's lots of lesson plans created by teachers that have gone through her one week workshops over the years, two week workshops. Uh, so that is a great resource. Oracle Academy has some great workshops in a box and modules and things like that. So we highly recommend checking out them. Um, another ebook, this is the Beth Simon and this work was sort of transitioned into some CS principles. Again, um, we are trying to provide as many resources as we can, but there's also just great people that have created great resources out there. So please dig deep into our website to find them. Um, here are a bunch of how-to videos. We're continuing to create more on these. These can be things, especially for kids working at home, that can supplement and they can find things there. Stuff around creating audio. Our VR programming stuff will be here. How to use the Alice player. Um, the built-in features for sharing Alice are not as robust as we would like. And instead of investing a lot of effort there, we created a how-to on how to use some sort of free software OBS to, to video capture work. Again, there will be another one here soon around how to use the Unity Player to encapsulate yours. Again, more great resources from Susan in terms of how-tos. Um, also on our YouTube channels and playlists. Um, if you go to our YouTube channel, there's a bunch of other um, playlists down here that have other people's videos that they've made over the years. Bill Barnum, one of our teachers, has created a bunch of great how-to videos. We are gonna try and fold those all into our how-to pages as best we can, um, but there's yet more content hiding in here for other great how-to videos that have been created by different educational partners as well. Like I said, here's sort of the lessons that are available from our website for Ellis. Um, they're getting started, so this is what we will be using as the workshop progresses. Um, again, there are all those other great resources I highly recommend. These are the ones we will be covering as we move week to week. So building a scene is where we'll begin of just how to create scenes, programming in Alice, and then our first design lesson, which is sort of how you use that editor process and storyboarding. All of those wrap up into 
our Hour of Code materials is a shortened version of those three lessons. It's also a great thing for just a short project if you wanted to do it. Um, those types of things, Hour of Code is great, but obviously that same premise can be used. It's this, those materials are what I use when I'll do a half day workshop with kids or after school programming and things like that. So it allows you to jump in and make a cool animation on a shorter period of time. As you see, then we can get into some more of the deeper concepts of using functions, control structures, which is sort of the if else blocks. So how do you create something? Those are great for adventure games. So if the door is locked, I can't go through. If I have a key, I can unlock the door, those types of things. Um, events for collisions and talking to people and things like that. We have smaller lessons that are really only necessary if you wanted to delve deeper into them. And then, like I said, we sort of have a three, three level design one where there's the introduction design, which is how to um, create an animation and a linear story. Then we have interactive narrative and open world. So once you've gotten a little bit of the, the more complex things you can do in Alice, you can make an open world where you run around and maybe it doesn't have variables and game mechanics um, or just sort of talk to this person, branching narrative type things. So there's some design elements in there. And then one for designing games, which sort of talks through creating game design documents and how you think about level design and those types of things. If you are a parent at home or just a teacher trying to give things, there are guided sort of tutorials, all of the materials that we have on our website. So here is scene building. These are the basic ones. We will continue to add to these as for the lessons that exist already um, and some extra added ones. So the general materials that we will provide, and this would be whether you're trying to do this self-guided or you are trying to do it as a you know, home educator or teacher online directed learning, We've created all the materials that we think will be helpful for you. Um, again, other teachers on our listserv and things like that may have created yet more materials that will be helpful. They're in Google and downloadable formats so that if you don't really have internet, but you can get it just to sort of get materials and then be offline again, you can download them. Um, each one will have sort of a slide deck that we will sort of see as we go through Alice. Um, and it, it goes with facilitation guides. The facilitation guide has some ideas of how you can run through it, talking points, what some of the learning objectives are, um, vocabulary, a lot of those types of resources that will help support you. The presentation that goes with it, even if you are just doing this yourself to learn Alice, these can be great for just walking through. So you'll see that the scene building one that we'll be going over next week talks about the interface, the different components of the interface, what an object in Alice is, what it means to move it. So I'm not going to go too deep into there because we're going to get there. Um, and then some assessment materials. So just quiz materials if you wanted them. Again, trying to create more of those and share other teachers out as we go. Um, at the bottom of the pages of those lessons, you'll see links to relevant how-tos that are covered in it so that if you want to do jump out and show those videos until you're comfortable demoing them yourself in Alice. It will link over to the tutorial and any other sort of exercises and projects that teachers or we create that it can be sort of other things that once you've done the lesson you want to do. Each of the exercises and projects then has sort of a handout um, that walks you through just step by step. These are meant to be sort of creative exercises, but that if you go through them step by step, you'll learn and implement all of the skills that you learned in the lesson. So we hope that these can allow you to sort of have a check-in, create something simple, make sure you understand it. And then again, we are very interested in you sort of getting to the part where kids can create their own uh, or users can create their own creative expressions so that you would get from this to the point where then you let them loose to do whatever you like. A lot of it comes down to the learning style, engagement styles and things like that, or how much confidence you wanna build before you let them loose. This, if you are here, maybe you found this and this is how you found the video. Uh, we have a workshop section as different community members start to do different things for our group. Um, we'll have more and more things there um, as we update them as we go for even this one. Well, this should be showing uh, the ones for right now. It's just slow to load. So check here for updates on this um, the last thing i will show if the internet will allow me to 
is that this is another an Alice's Adventure. We might do a side module on this. This was the adventure creation tool, this um, I will briefly show it. That is meant to be a 2D based um, adventure game creation tool. So in this one, you build simple environments and then the puzzles instead of being code vocabulary is game design vocabulary. So if I add a puzzle, I can have it be to get an item. Um, I would need to add an item first. So we'll put a character here. We'll use Alice. So Alice, if I do, the goal is to get an item. The goal is to get Alice. How do I get it? I get Alice by picking her up. I create that puzzle. I actually set it to be the win condition of my adventure game. I can then play this. First, I will need to save this. And now you can see I can click on Alice. I've enabled the ability to get Alice. I picked up Alice, and so I win the game. Um, we have some other things buried on our site that can be great resources for just playing around and learning how to do things and sort of programming and art and design. Um, so that's another thing that we're pretty, pretty proud of. On the community side of things, this is where you can find other featured resources. This is where you can find the um, forum, but most importantly, this teacher community. This will take you to a very uh, CMU page for signing up for our teacher listserv. This is a great resource for getting things as well. So definitely please do that. Um, we also have a contact form here. Um, so this is another way to reach us directly. And so definitely let us know as you have needs and or want more materials and things like that, what we can do for you there. On that note, I will stop sharing, bring us back for any questions on that? How was like that for to, everybody? I'd like to, it was very good. I'd like to know more about the Unity um, thing and can I use it on Windows 7? You should be able to. We have not tested it on all, but I mean, one of the reasons to make that player in Unity was that it is, they do a lot of work obviously for cross-platform support and things like that. So leaning on them for our rendering makes it uh, a much more stable platform for sharing worlds and things like that. So we're pretty excited about it. You can on alice.org on the get Alice. Um, it won't be one of the main ones. So you'll have to use the left navigation. That was the Unity plus VR beta. Um, the player is downloadable from there. I would say hold off a day or two. We're about to put on a new version um, very shortly that has a whole bunch of new features on it and things like that. Um, and yeah, I will update a lot of things there as we go. I'm, I'm doing something with kids in our uh, area, uh, middle school students, now that we're all locked down. Yeah. So the parents have come into, have come into, friends of mine who have children. Uh, we're doing some things, but mostly we're dealing with Alice too. Yeah, I'm going to focus on Alice 3 for this one just because I don't have the bandwidth to do both. Alice 2 is still a great tool. Um, I will be, you know, hopefully we'll be promoting this more and so we'll have more people show up live for these things. But like I said, I'm recording this one. I'll record the scenes as we move forward or the workshop segments as we move forward. So even if it is not sort of intended for kids to show up directly hopefully if the parent needs some help they can actually just use that video as a, a scene building lesson or something like that we'll just mm -hmm. sort of learn as we go what i can do to help all the educators and parents out there so yeah any other questions from anybody out there this is a a good start for me as well uh i'm i'm looking for something interesting for um both my middle schoolers and high schoolers to do. Um, it looks like this could be something to get them started. Um, but I also had a, a request, um, sure. and we had talked about it at the spring conference, the Oregon CSTA spring conference. We are going to go virtual for obvious reasons, yeah. uh, and we're still going to do it at the end of June. And I was just wondering what your availability might be to do a, a workshop. Uh, I'd be happy to. Um, 
like I said, I mean, I just posted this one and so we haven't promoted it much, but doing more. So hopefully we'll get more people showing up directly to these, but I did record this and I'm recording this. So each of the lessons I'm going to do, I will also post up so that they will be there to help teachers and things like that. But uh, yeah, we are so, open to doing whatever we can to help just based on sort of availability and things like that. Great. And then, yeah, we will shut this one down in about two minutes and open up another one that is just for open QA. Um, and so we'll definitely continue to host those so that then there is sort of a resource for teachers if they need questions on how to do things in Alice or even potentially open it up to students that are trying to do things. We'll just sort of see how it goes as we move along. And I don't know if this time will work, which is why I guess I'll record. Some teachers have already moved to the point where right now they might be hosting a class or dealing with school. Mm -hmm. But I figure people have enough on their plate that they don't want to do it before or after their work day. They need to decompress at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think this is a good, it, it certainly works uh, for me. Um, I, I think you're still on the West Coast. I am. Yeah. We are, we are holed up here in Portland. Uh, yes. Well, um, no, this was, this was great. And when you say uh, recordings, um, will you host them directly on your Alice website or will they be YouTube or? What are you thinking? Yeah, I am open to both of those. I tested out sort of streaming to our YouTube channel. So that's set up. I didn't do it on this one, but I did record it. So I'll just try and edit it down for length if at all possible, or just post the whole thing up to our YouTube channel. So I'll create a YouTube channel for all of these videos to just live on. Um, I will also, if there is interest or a need, I mean, I feel like most people have gotten Zoom under control, so it shouldn't be hard for them to join. Um, but if I get and look at our sort of social media and or our email after I get off this and it looks like some people just couldn't get into Zoom, potentially I'll just stream them live on YouTube as well in case somebody can't get into Zoom. Um, or if people wanted to invite their students to just show up and watch, maybe we don't fill this room with a bunch of students, but they could uh, watch on YouTube. So I'll put that link into the workshop info um, if we think that that would be helpful for just letting parents let their kids watch, but not necessarily wanting them to be in here. Um, so yeah, I'm open to all of this, so. Right, and so when you say uh, YouTube channel, is that just the, the CMU channel or do you have an Alice channel? No, let me, let me share out again. Yeah, sorry, I arrived late, so I probably missed not some problem. of this. There will be a video. Actually, I mean, depending on when you got here, the resources stuff was at the end. So that was where I was getting to. Um, you can get to this through, I mean, essentially in our resources, I think I should probably put this somewhere else too. Learning a lot about our website and what people can find without guidance through this new era okay. we live in. Um, right, right. In Alice resources, and I think on both Alice 3 and 2, at the bottom of how to's, there is, a link over to our YouTube channel. So this is one way to get mm -hmm. there. Um, it is just the Alice project on YouTube, but there are lots of Alice's out there. There's a bunch of Alice project bands and things like that. So I will probably put something up to help people find this one. Um, so this is where all of the created playlists will be. I will create a playlist on this that just says spring zoom workshop videos or something like that. And so I'll post them there as we go. And then honestly, I haven't done it enough to know. I mean, we can test it right now. Um, that if I have to go all the way back around, I set this up. We'll see what happens if I do it. If I do the live on YouTube, it sh I don't know where, well, I won't show you me logging into all of our accounts then. So scratch that. I will do it beforehand. <laughs> Okay. Um, but yeah, here it shows up. And so I think when you come to our channel, if there is a live streaming, there will be a band that pops up. So I will just share out a link to our YouTube channel and then it should alert when there is a new video streaming. Um, from having looked at other people's streamings, I've generally just gotten direct links, um, but I would presume that it's gonna show up right about here. Right. Yeah, I see uh, you posted a, t a one minute test stream, it looks like recently. Uh, yep. And I assume this one will be up there some point. Yeah. Where does that live? Oh, sorry. I just clicked on videos. Usually if I click on videos, that shows the most recent 
recent videos. Yeah, there you are. There it is. <laughs> I will remove that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, so sounds good. Okay, uh, this is this is great. And so so these seem to be really centered on um, teachers. Um, mm -hmm. And are are you going to be adding anything new that you know you might want students to watch? Yeah, I mean, this one was just the overview of all things, Alice, and I wanted to point to resources. I mean, even if there was a kid watching now or watching this video, I mean, I hope that they would see where the how-to videos are and the lesson content and just what Alice is and show what it is. I mean, obviously, my vocabulary is probably a little bit high up. It's not the intensity of a kid YouTube video, um, <laughs> but I think there's still valuable stuff in there, and they could oh, yeah. watch a very dry one. When we jump into the scene one next week and things like that, and I actually get into the teaching ones, I mean, they are going to be, you know, a lesson the same way that when we teach it to teachers, I use the materials we use and teach them as if they are essentially the students. So they will know that the materials that I am using are the ones that they could use and the way that I am teaching it is the way that they could teach it. I might throw a couple of things in there of just things to watch out if you're a teacher or parent that says, you know, like this scene editor, if a world is built that is super rich. It might be one of those starter worlds. If you're a kid, doesn't matter, and you just got a cheat for how you could do it, but you also know that your teacher now knows that they, knows that you know that you could do that. So there might be some things in there that are just sort of some teaching tips thrown in, but they are gonna be just lessons that I think if a kid wanted to, to log in and watch, they would basically be taking the Eric version of the class. Great, that sounds like a great mix, yeah. Mm -hmm. 